A warning today from the Speaker of the House of Commons telling members of Parliament to change their ways or risk losing their privileges. The Chair therefore invites members to be more judicious in their choice of words and behaviour. If they are not, the Chair will have no choice but to discipline those members who persist in their unparliamentary behaviour. This warning was related to that tense moment between the Conservative and NDP leaders last week. Fergus said Jagmeet Singh did apologize for his actions, but Pierre Polyev did not, which cost the Conservative leader today in question period. Having not withdrawn his comments, I will therefore remove three questions from the leader of the official opposition in the opening round today. Okay, that moment between Singh and Polyev was early in the sitting. Polyev called Singh a fake, a phony, and a fraud. And in response, Singh walked into the aisle of the House of Commons to confront Polyev, and it's gone downhill since then. The most recent and still unresolved issue was from yesterday. Take a listen to this. Did you engage each other in the bathtub? That's the comment that tipped an already rowdy question period to an all-out yelling match. The Prime Minister accused the Conservatives of making a homophobic slur, leading to this in the House today. I've seen a lot of degrading elements in the history of my time here, but I've never seen anything as ugly as what happened yesterday. We saw a disgusting display of homophobia. I just want to remind members to please be careful. We were seeing uh, aspersions and, and, and quite frankly lies coming from the other Again, side. I think that it's time for, for members to please uh, be judicious, to please think twice before they speak. There is actually video evidence now of the member from Sherwood Park Fort, Saskatchewan. The a different debate. This is becoming a different debate. To what is extreme cowardice from a from that side of the house that can't admit. So, so this this is this is starting to snowball more and more. And it didn't stop there. The Conservative MP, Garnet Jenis, who is accused of that homophobic slur, stood up in the House this afternoon and tried to explain himself. Does he engage with them in the bathtub? The point of that comment is to illustrate that, of course, meetings don't take place in a bathtub. Luxury, a luxurious bathtub has nothing to do with meetings. The Prime Minister's answer had nothing to do with the questions, but it had nothing to do with sex. I wasn't thinking about sex at all. Okay, so that's where we'll begin today uh, with the power panel, who I'm sure are very excited to be talking about this. Cameron Amott is a former head of communications to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. James Moore is a former Conservative cabinet minister. Andrew Thompson is a former Saskatchewan NDP cabinet minister. And Shachi Curl is the president of the Angus Reid Institute. Um, Shachi, normally I write down like a list of little questions that I want to ask. And the question I just wrote down today is WTF question mark. What do you make of what the heck is happening in the House of Commons since it came back? I am just so sick, David, at this stage of MPs all getting up in the House and saying, oh, things are getting terrible. They're really going downhill. It's getting more toxic when they are engaging in the toxicity of it all. And as to the speaker, Mr. Fergus, how many more? Ch I mean, I, I please, somebody go find a kindergarten or a grade one teacher and put them in the speaker's chair because they will have a better, more effective time handling this crowd than Mr. Mr. Fergus appears to be, and it's not about Mr. Fergus, it is about a long line of speakers who have not done what needs to be done. And yes, we saw the opposition leader uh, have his privileges removed today. Great, it's one day. But, you know, this stuff is not being policed in, in, in Parliament. Uh, it, is, it, it turns into viral clippage outside of Parliament on Twitter, on X, on, on, on Facebook, on YouTube, and in other places. And it's all being done with this winky, winky, nudgy, nudgy knowingness of politicians, of strategists and politicos who say, this is terrible. We have to clean up the tone. We have to make it less toxic. We have to make it less polarizing and less gross. Oh, but now now we're all going to do it anyway because it's effective in terms of targeting and motivating our support right. bases. Like, who is going to be the person who breaks the circuit around all of this? And it's the reason why today you see a 50-year low in the overall popularity of not just one major party leader, but all three of them uh, have never been as unpopular as any of their uh, counterparts over, over a five-decade trend. People right. don't like the divided discourse. It turns them off. 
But Andrew, what you're seeing in question period every day, and I, 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 like I know this is maybe a Planet Ottawa thing, but I'm not so sure it is. Like there is a blatant disrespect for the speaker who is struggling for a bunch of reasons that you know, he, he's had to de deal with since he got in there. But just on the basic function and basic rules of how the House of Commons is supposed to work, I mean, Pierre Polyev lost three questions today because he wouldn't withdraw his remark. He's intent on not saying he's sorry. And you saw Garnet Jenis there. Um, I don't know what he meant when he shouted out to the Prime Minister in the debate about the, the New York City apartment. Did you engage with Tom Clark in the bathtub? Um, the impact of it is that people saw it in a negative way. I mean, what are your thoughts on that specific moment? Let me pick this up. I mean, I fundamentally disagree with what, what Shachri just said about this being a problem on all sides. There's one common thread about who is trying to destabilize and bring Parliament into the, you know, into the gutter, and that is a, a cause driven by the Conservative Party who is trying to feign outrage. Now, there, normally, there, no, an unruly Andrew, there, house... There is, just just, just there, let him make his point. Just let him make his point. I'll get you in. Just let him finish. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, you know, look, uh, I think this both sides piece that, you know, we have a tendency to like to do on this panel. It doesn't work in this case. I mean, there are the Conservatives, and they're doing it for a reason, and that is to try to make it look like the Liberals have lost control of the House. The problem here is, I think increasingly, it's blowing back on the Conservatives. And what they look like is a party that's undisciplined and unfit to govern. And if that sticks, if this comes down to that kind of an issue, I think it works against them. But this is, uh, you know, this is, is, as you pointed out, it's a tactic. It's not something that's just organic within the House. It's not just something about individuals not liking each other. There is a strategy here. And that strategy is being driven by an opposition party that is trying to kind of foment that sense that the House is broken, Canada is broken, the government's broken, and the only fix is them. Such a quick rebuttal. I know you wanted to get in there, like 30 yeah, seconds. This, yeah, just, just the, the, the idea that, oh, well, you know, there's one party doing it or one party engaging in it. You know, I'm sorry that's not true. We can well, talk about the, no, we can talk about the I know you like to degrees. play both sides on this. I mean, this I is our I'm usual Thursday conversation. I am not playing anything. I am not, well, I am not playing anything. It's not both you, sides. It is both sides. It's all sides, oh. frankly. Okay. Now, you want to, no, let me finish. You want to talk about, you want to talk about the level of responsibility or the level of weight on one side or the other? Fine, we can get into that. I, I can't think of anything any more intimate than sharing a bathtub with someone, and so I call baloney on what Garnet was saying. That said, right. okay. don't, don't, do not let, do not, do not pretend or presume that other parties aren't engaging in this or playing it, it because they are. Mm. Okay, well, you know, but James, um, to Andrew's point, uh, it, the incident that sparked the, the moment last week that caused uh, the, the loss of the questions today for Mr. Polyev, he stood up and called Jagmeet Singh a fake, a phony, and a fraud, right? Which is, he directed a question to the leader of the fourth party, which you're not supposed to do, and he used language that isn't calling him a liar, but it's calling him a liar, uh, and it runs up against it, and then they sent out a fundraising email calling him a liar. Uh, I've not seen that from the other parties, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the rhetoric of our politics outside of the House, online, in fundraising letters and all that, there's supposed to be an elevation in, of the quality of what you say inside of the House. But those lines get blurred when you use clips from Parliament outside of the House. So all these things are, are, are frankly, kind of a wash. Uh, look, if, if Pierre Polyev loses any voters or support because he comes at this a little too hot, then that's on him. He's made a calculus about that. I mean, it's not it's not an approach that I, that I, I think in the long run works well. You know, for governments to be defeated and for you to have the privilege and the opportunity to become the government and become the prime minister of Canada, two things have to happen in sequence. One is the public has to be wanting to get rid of the incumbent government. And second is they have to really want you to be the government and to be the prime minister. And the degree to which you elevate your rhetoric and you elevate your heat inside the chamber that is supposed to be of a higher esteem than kind of what we see on Twitter or what we see in fundraising letters, the degree in that room that you, you don't sort of raise your game and be seen to be uh, prepared to be the CEO of a G7 country with the, and you sort of breathe in the office of the, of the prime minister and you, and you elevate your rhetoric and your language and presentation, I think you limit the number of Canadians who are going to be prepared, prepared to do that one, two step of saying, I want to get rid of this government. And better than that, I want you to be the government. And so I, so I, I think those moments when you're excessively hot, I think you take a step back more than you take a step forward. Cameron, uh, what did you make of, of what we saw there and, and the way it played out? Well, the whole show, the whole thing is depressing. Uh, yes. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate is a really light way to describe it. It's um, there is truth in what Shachi's saying in the sense that every party 
does heckle. Every party does attack their opponents. Every party gets emotion. Every you know members from every party can get emotional, can get carried away. I saw a clip of Mark Holland talking about this today, and I think he he framed it quite well. You know, everybody can get ahead of themselves. Everybody can make mistakes. But I agree with Andrew that there is one party that is trying a lot harder than the other ones to employ a very sneering, juvenile, insult-driven approach to everything they say. It's not like, oh, oops, we got out of hand. Oops, we said something a little bit that, that went a little bit too far, and we recognize that. It's every single day. It's the framing of every single question. It's the, even the framing of the topic. Like, the topic from this latest one was supposed to be about housing, and they're using the example of the Consul General's home, which we've talked about on this panel at yep. least once before, which we know the facts are not on the side of their argument that this was a decision driven seemingly by the department and it ultimately saves the government some money. So it's not an accurate or fair or legitimate um, way of discussing a much bigger and more important topic, which is housing for all Canadians. Um, mm -hmm. And what does it, what does it lead to? It leads to this type of ridiculous, you know, um, driving up of people's passions and heckling that, sounds completely inappropriate if the conservative member who said that wants to explain himself he abs the burden of explaining himself is on him it's not on the prime minister who called him out for saying something inappropriate whether it was specifically homophobic or whether he meant it differently it's just inappropriate and it's not in any way helpful to advancing a conversation about the issue that the leader of the opposition claims feigns right. to want to advance yeah there's the intent of what you're saying and then there's the impact of what you're saying and you need to be aware of both right this is a hard lesson people learn but like shachi just to come back with this like yeah everyone does a bit of heckling but there is a weaponization of what is happening here that is different and let's give you an example there there was a new climate report out today saying that canada needs to tweak its policies and make it more aggressive you're going to hit your 2035 target we reached out to the conservatives to ask them for comment on this because of the advisory board of just a bunch of you know canadians working hard on the climate file and part of the response we got gave no explanation of their policy, but instead they said, there's a phrase that says, it's no surprise that Trudeau appointed pointy-headed bureaucrats on fake advisory boards are demanding harsher policies that will hurt Canadians. Why do you have to call them pointy-headed bureaucrats? Why do you have to insult everybody who just disagrees with you on issues of policy and a, a solution to a, a problem? Call it a case of not being able to help yourself, I guess. I think in, in this case, you've got people in the leader's office. You've got the leader himself who likes to, to engage in, in this kind of, I would call it twerpy behavior, this snarky extra dig, you know, make the extra insult. Uh, to what end? I, I think uh, that James makes a point where if, if the party ends up losing people because this is a turnoff, it is on them. You get to a point where uh, a party that's 20 points up in the polls probably doesn't want to say very much of substance, right? You, you, don't, you don't want uh, an own goal. You don't want to put yourself out there. You want to sit on that lead and, and not do anything too controversial or, or too stretchy in terms of policy. So the better part of valor, if, if you're in a situation like that, regardless regardless of whatever the party is in that leading situation, is to say as little as possible. But in the snark, in the snark, they're actually showing us a significant part of who they are. And when I talk about mm. the all sides or the, or the all sides isms of it, yes, it does happen on all sides, but it's on this side in particular where it is politically perhaps most potentially damaging because people don't know a ton about who the conservatives are at this point. Right. They have migrated over mostly from the Liberal Party because they are looking for change, because they are fatigued, and they do not see this government as the one to solve their problems. Uh, and so they are putting a lot of trust and a lot of faith in the Conservative Party at that moment. It's one thing to say, hey, we're not going to talk about what we would do. We're going to focus on criticizing what the other guys are doing. But it is, to your point, and even to Andrew's point, even though I disagree with what he said earlier, <laughs> to his point, uh, it is it is a, a level of snark that actually has the potential to do way more damage because they are they are showing us to an extent who they are. So so Andrew, I mean, what does this tell us about the type of government we would get 
should the polls be correct and, and, and there is a change in government in the next election and the Conservative win when you, you have just a simple request for, hey, what do you think of the climate policy, leads to an insult of people who have made a recommendation. I mean, it, 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 is, it is an unnecessary punch down, it seems. Like, if you're 20 points ahead and you're riding it, you feel this is where you transition to that, as James was talking about, like, we're ready to go. We're going to be statesmen. We're ready to be there. And instead, it's this kind of a thing. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you can read into it. I mean, it shows what their kind of instincts are. And, you know, there's this kind of bearing of fangs and, you know, uh, a desire for red meat and blood, uh, you know, from them. But I don't know what it means from a policy perspective because they don't seem to go into it. And it's not just a case of being cautious. I mean, being cautious is not making dumb mistakes where you're trying to make a point about lavish spending and you get dragged off for two days talking about whether or not one of your frankly, uh, less likely to be in cabinet members, uh, you know, is making some kind of a homophobic slur. And this is, I think, the, the, you know, where they are making a mistake between what works, you know, in the, uh, the party rooms and what works in, you know, the, the, the rallies mm. to kind of uh, be a little bit of a sneer and a snide uh, remark uh, when it actually comes out into the public and you've got people really kind of looking at them going, what, is the, what are these guys about? You know, maybe this guy is going to be the prime minister. Maybe this other guy is going to be in the cabinet. What are these guys like? And I think a lot of people go, well, I, I just don't know. All right, quick uh, final thoughts from James and, and then Cameron, and then I want to introduce another topic because uh, something has happened that we want to update our, our audience on. James, your thoughts on that? I mean, look, whatever. Like, <laughs> my, my <laughs> is, like, I mean, is, is spending time scrutinizing the official opposition's talking points. I don't remember having these conversations on panels when liberals were calling conservatives and, you know, that we didn't care about uh, murdered Aboriginal women or that we didn't care about climate change. We were anti-science. And, like, I, I don't remember having these conversations about conservative talking, uh, uh, liberal talking points when we, we were in government, but whatever. Um, my advice to everybody in Parliament is this, having been there and having lost my temper a time or two, just if you think you need to yell something across the floor and to make a point and to make the people around you laugh and you think you're being cute and witty, don't. Just get up, mm. go for a walk, mm. and just cool off because every member of parliament represents 100,000 people, which is to say five times the number of people who fit in a fully packed Rogers Arena here in Vancouver. You represent 100,000 people. I don't, if they were all looking at you, yelling across the parliament, whatever you're yelling, it's not a good look. Don't do it. Don't heckle. Just. Right be responsible. Well, James, I'd be happy to talk about policy if a request for, you know, a position on climate, for example, gave us an answer, right? Like, we've had a couple of confidence votes this week already. They want to have a carbon tax election. You'd think there'd be some discussion of climate policy at this point, other than what they're going to get rid of rather than what they're going to bring in. Like, it's tough to have the well, conversations kind of about that, right? Well, well, with respect, we could have spent the first five minutes, ten minutes on this panel talking about policy, and instead we're talking about decorum in Parliament. If you want to talk about policy, let's talk policy. Okay. You like this stuff. What, what's you our like climate? Well, yeah. Well, what is our climate? I had you a lot of conversations on the show they're on the climate opposition. policy. They're not, David, they're not the government. They're the opposition. Par the ca election campaigns are when you put forward your platforms about sure. what you would do when you're in government. They're the opposition. When the time comes for them to ask Canadians to give them the opportunity to form government, they'll put forward their platform. Don't criticize them for not being the government now. When, they're, when, they, when they go to Canadians and ask to be the government, they'll put forward their policy. That's how our system works. Okay. Yeah, but right. James, they've been trying to bring down the government and force an election. And if yes, you try to bring down the job. government and they're force an election, shouldn't you bring forward what your policies are? Like, I thought it was very yeah, weird that Andrew Scheer saying, oh, no, 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 we're not there yet. You know, when they're That's trying actively to bring for. it down. Th that's that's what definitely campaigns what campaigns are for. Are for. I, I don't require. I, I don't. I don't recall Wab Canoe putting out a, a fully detailed. You wait until the campaign. He brought down Brian Pallister. Then he, yeah, you know, the, the the NDP in Manitoba. They brought mm. down and attacked and, and criticized, criticized Premier Stephenson. The campaign is launched. You put forward your platform. You say trust us to do better. That's how our system works. Here we are spending the whole time chastising the opposition for not acting like a government. They're not the government. They're the opposition. The time. Their time will come. Okay, or Cameron. Not. Cameron, go ahead. I think it's fair to expect not a full platform, certainly not a fully, you know, 20 page uh, outline policy positions on every single issue. But I think it's fair to, to at least expect a higher level of thoughtfulness on the issues that they speak about day in and day out. It's more we should expect and we should demand, fr frankly, more from all parties, not just the official opposition, than a slogan or a one sentence attack, which is as we've talked about, laden with insults, sneering, and really inappropriate language, or at least framing, uh, on, on the way they attack the government. And I don't think that's unfair or biased to say that, oh, we should be demanding 
a full government platform from the opposition. No, we're just expecting a slightly more thoughtful, elevated level of conversation about these topics. The same goes for any party who's in opposition. And it is fair to, I think it is fair to push them on that. They are, after all, demanding an election as soon as they can um, in these repeated uh, non-confidence motions. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'd be happy with the conversation and at least a, a partial answer, but, but here we are. But look, 